At this point, Dominic Covey gets up to <coughs> conduct the discussion. Unfortunately, Dominic couldn't be with us this week, so I'll call for me to be the moderator, if you will, of any discussion that might go on and solicit questions from you. So, are there any questions that you have for a speaker in terms of the, uh, what's going on? Oh. You didn't mention it specifically, but I'm almost sure it's true. Did you have a requirement that all of the projects had compatible EHR so that they could talk to each other? No. Yeah. No. So Quebec could be different <coughs> to Atlantic. The, uh, the, the first slide or the second slide we want to build on the health infrastructure of other provinces. So each province, they're king in their territory, okay? And they don't want the federal government, especially the federal government, to walk in and say, okay, this is the data set that you're going to use. They've already invested, they're already developing. And so Quebec's data set is very different than what Ontario is. Ontario is heading towards MDS, and, uh, but Quebec is not using that at all. How are we going to make sure that the data in Quebec is going to be able to communicate with the data in Ontario and then, then continue on from Ontario over to BC? We're going to have fun with that, but there is a solution. We have a bunch of engineers here. <laughs> this is where there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So interoperability is a major issue. In the States, they have it easier. They have the federal government, Medicare, and they <coughs> next year for electronic records to be of one particular type. Okay. And this, it's all being done. And the projects that have worked there, mm -hmm. that have been the ones where they've taken existing data sets and written things to glue them together, mm -hmm. rather than trying to get a, a giant edifice in Ontario or New York or wherever. Mm -hmm. Healthcare providers that have done that. Was any project done like that where basically took existing records and, and had somebody write the software to translate between them and come up with this kind of provided <coughs> network? I understand that New Brunswick is that way and they totally integrated. Um, the rest um, basically is uh, different providers, different industry partners that have contributed different pieces of software. And, uh, <coughs> but uh, New Brunswick definitely is integrated. <laughs> your last statements on your last slide said a standard survey is being conducted for all projects. Now, is this the standards? Does that include the standards that Colin is talking about, standards that can be used by all provinces to talk to each other? It's what the projects are using. What are they using? So if uh, you're using MediSolutions, electronic health record for, uh, I don't know, uh, home care, that's what you're using. And so then we'll look at what is it that they're using, have what they have incorporated in their, uh, their standards. I understand that for home care, MediSolution is developed as using MDS because they say, hey, we're going to sell this to Ontario. That's where they're going. So MDS is the standard for the data set for that particular project in that province. It, for that particular project. Then we're going to compare it with the other project and the other project, and then we're going to see what comes out of all of this. Well, we want to know what's out there in the market and what standards are being recognized as valid by the developers, industry, and by those purchasing it. And so it gives us a two-way confirmation. So from there, we have a groundwork and we can build up and then we can do a gap analysis between what existing standards are in place and what standards are not, and then start working from there. <coughs> <laughs> we <coughs> actually, some of them have continued ahead, found alternative funding, and went ahead with their implementation. Um, we are uh, looking at, uh, we have undertaken some initiative to stay in touch with all of those applicants to find out what they're doing and uh, what their priorities are right now. Was there any effort to say, speak to maybe industry candidate to see if there were to be a dialogue with the private sector to see that maybe the private sector might see some opportunity in any of those? I, 
I don't think that we did an intervention from that perspective. Um, industry in healthcare usually is not, it's like oil and water and, uh, or oil and vinegar. <laughs> it just, uh, so Industry Canada, the, the vendors that are participated in the projects, they have to take their initiative to Industry Canada and see if there are fundings for development of systems and help them market those systems to the healthcare industry. What Health Canada does is that we provide, we're in the healthcare service delivery in healthcare. So we're going to fund initiatives that are going to impact healthcare services. So we're not funding ICTs, we're funding the service that is being enabled by ICTs. It so happens that a lot of the partners are private enterprise that are uh, developers of information communication technologies. So we have to define these roles very clearly. So Industry Canada is definitely the focus point for the private industry sector that are developing the solutions for the healthcare industry. Can you uh, answer a question how uh, <coughs> Canada is working with the provinces and we'll take uh, Ontario specifically with the smart systems. Smart systems establishing a network through Ontario connecting hospitals. The, many of the telehealth projects <coughs> also involved in connectivity. Mm -hmm. How are the two projects being merged? Smart systems actually use the chip funded projects, uh, especially those connecting all of the hospitals, as being the um, launching point, if you want, or the, uh, the priority uh, uh, step for the deployment of the connectivity of the infrastructure. So uh, they looked at here's a chip, federal government investment here, that is actual implementation. And all of their partners are health institutions, provincially funded health institutions. Those are the clients of Smart Systems for Health. So they're going to, what they said, they approached all the CHIP projects, telehealth projects, and asked them, let's work together. And you're going to work with this institution. I'm going to make sure to understand what your needs are before I go in and put a circuit in. If you need 15 megabytes, then I'm going to make sure that they have that capability of providing you uh, that, uh, that bandwidth. If you only need one megabyte, well, then that's a different story, and they'll be able to adjust the, uh, the need. So their clients, so they went to each hospital. The hospitals are the ones that are the clients of Smart Systems for Health, but in collaboration with Health Canada and the CHIP funded project, they were able to identify what the needs were for these institutions. So there's a very close uh, collaboration. There's we have constant uh, dialogue. Actually, I'm the uh, uh, DSL officer for Ontario and the federal government. And so I have uh, bi-weekly talks with uh, the team at Smart Systems. Because they do have to tie together. Now, of course, the Ministry of Health, uh, the provincial government, is also involved in the uh, ACHI, uh, the Advisory Council uh, for Health Infrastructure. And uh, so, of course, their input is on a regular basis there. So there's that, at that level as well, there is the collaboration. Questions? Comments? The unfold um, question, the Smart System for Health, they said it's arm's length, but where do they get their money from? They, got, they, they get their money from, uh, from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care that they funded. So the whole organizational structure as far as where all their money is, but initially and for the first quarter, it's uh, the Ministry of Health that provided them with the initial budget. Now they've recently been incorporated, and uh, so now they're just starting to develop their operational framework and get things under in place. As far as the intricacies of where they're going to get their future funds, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Was, uh, you mentioned New Brunswick, the fact that they managed to get one system across the whole province. Considering, and I mean, I was heard of this, and I believe you said it to the medical or the health field in general, it's a bunch of silos all over the place, which don't talk to each other very well, that's all. Mm -hmm. How did they pull that one off? <laughs> uh, Mr. McKenna's gone, so. <laughs> 
it's, uh, I really don't know. If they have the, uh, the, the, the secret, the, the, they should be unveiling that, uh, that secret at the ACHI and, and get everybody to, uh, to join in and to deploy it that way, which is another uh, important aspect of these uh, regular meetings of this community because, of this, because they, they have to share their uh, experiences, their successes and their mistakes. And uh, so it would be wonderful if we had that secret. <laughs> I, I found it phenomenal. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, sorry, sure Okay. Just wondering, uh, that 2% that you said was spent on ICT healthcare, is that based on Health Canada or is that including the uh, provincial health systems as well? My understanding of those stats is that it includes the provincial, it's healthcare spending in Canada, it's the industry of healthcare. Okay. Not the federal government. And you said obviously that's very low. Have they projected what kind of numbers they're trying to reach to make it more reasonable in the next? year or two? No. no I'm not, not that I'm aware of. I shouldn't say no. But I'm not aware that they have made projections of uh, set definite targets as far as the healthcare spending budgets that they want to allocate. Who, who's gathering these two? Uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, uh, KIHI, for Health Information, uh, there is, uh, as well as Health Canada, gathers them and Statistics Canada as well. In your previous seminar, we uh, there's some information provided on on spending and in health in terms of what other jurisdictions. Uh, and uh, for example, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, I think they spend they spend seven percent of their budget on uh, on that area. Uh, some estimates have been even if we went up to three or three and a half percent, there would be a there would be a lot better situation. You know which seminar that was? That was no. I, I, I think it was actually, I think it was Dominic's seminar. Yeah, uh, I think it was. That would have been in January. Yeah. And that's available on the web. Yeah. Uh, so you can take a look at it. Uh, and I'll just as a plug, but we hope to have actually uh, uh, the videos of each seminar available soon. So you can see the video as well. <laughs> and the uh, presentation. So we need more network. <laughs> don't, don't feel too bad. We've been at the bottom of the list uh, G8 for so long, I think we had to go over here. Mm -hmm. We're so far behind the rest of the world in research and development, it is unreal. It's a shame. It's appalling. But don't ask me why, but that's the way it is. But being the biggest issue now, there's uh, definitely uh, a reason that there should be more spending because that's going to be the biggest issue going forward. So. I think you have to keep in mind every other box that was on that chart gets their funding by the money you pay to buy their products. It's an entirely different system of funding than what healthcare has in Canada. Every cent that goes into healthcare IT in Canada comes from the federal government or the provincial government in some form or fashion. It doesn't show up out of people buying products. No, I'd have to qualify that. Is, is, do those figures include, say, pharmaceutical research and development, private sector? Those uh, numbers track to the Hay Survey, which track very closely to the Hay Survey of healthcare providers, which is hospitals. They're within a tenth of a percent of the Hay numbers. Health is a fascinating uh, system from the point of view that you know we don't really pay for what we get, at least not directly, and so it's very difficult to measure. And one of the questions that actually came up over lunch and comes up very frequently, every time I write a proposal for something, they always want to know about an argument for sustainability. And the argument for sustainability in the health field, I wonder if you'd like to comment a bit. Uh, what is the argument? What makes sense? Uh, in, if people can't get health care, that's obviously a bad thing, we believe. And if people couldn't get health care for an awful long time, all of a sudden we've changed our whole way of, of looking at the health system, of delivering health care and everything else. Well, that, that, that brings up the the of government, I think it's true of governments, uh, provincial governments, are looking to the population at large to take more, pers more personal charge of their own health. And I think that the theory being that if people take care of themselves and look at sick and there's not such so much pressure on the healthcare system, that will make sense. Um, most of what I saw, and I understand it's a function of your program, is devoted to the existing physical structure of healthcare. 
but are you aware of any problems, of any programs at the federal level or, or ongoing at the provincial level that are aimed at um, a greater awareness or facilitating people becoming, uh, being able to take, facilitating people being able to take more control of their own personal health care? Like we hear in healthcare, we hear doctors and hospitals and nurses and, and labs and, and on. But like I think I don't think I saw the word patient up there once. I think I saw client. So what about I wasn't sure that was patient. Uh, <coughs> actually, um, last week, um, which is last week, I'm actually talking this week here too. Uh, there was an, a consultation meeting of the various experts in home care and community care services, um, which is uh, under the title of eHealth for Home and uh, Communities. And one of the things that our, our uh, directorate is trying to examine is uh, what are the needs for the patients directly? How can ICTs enable healthcare delivery and access and meet the needs of the patient individually? You're right. Priority has been focused on institutional settings, telemedicine applications more so than uh, services directly to the patients. The patients benefit, but the key users of the technology are the physicians and the institutions. So what happens when we put the technology in the hands of the patients? What are they needs? How do we handle that? And what is it that but they expect? Is it how you handle it, or is it the decision that they the person the individual handles. It's the individual. It's it's demographically, how they we've got the boomers coming up to 50. They're going to start getting sick. And okay. historically, all the way back to when they came out of high school, they have never sat still for circumstances as they are. They will determine the way things are, are going to be to their own satisfaction. And I suggest to you that's going to have an impact on the healthcare system. They won't sit still for a doctor uh, taking a patronizing attitude and saying, now you take your two aspirins and go home and uh, call me when it's over. When, when I mentioned about the uh, CHI initiative, I mentioned the Canada Health Network, yeah. which is a portal of health information. Yeah. So this provides accurate or reliable health information to the public, to the patient. And so that's one way of uh, individuals of taking charge and taking uh, more in empowering them as far as uh, the management of their health condition. This is what we have right now in place. Now what we're examining is that are there other types of applications that we can implement or encourage implementation that will give them even greater sense of empowerment. One of the projects that I talked about is the telehome care project in the province of Quebec. It basically, what the, the patient who has a diabetic condition is going to be in the home. Throughout the whole process that they're going to be doing monitoring their uh, medical condition, recording back or observing how the information <coughs> is being recorded, they're learning. So there's a lot of patient education and monitoring their own systems. And then they'll be able to make and assess the linkage between, okay, this particular system uh, or symptom associated with this particular consequence or uh, action that I've taken. And so there's that self-management that's starting, it's going to kick in. So I agree with you 100%. A lot of the investment has been focused on institutional, where the primary user of ICT has been the care provider more so than the patient. But there are some applications that are going to address the needs of the patient. And we need the, uh, the, the engineers, the private sector, we need the academia to be able, and the healthcare industry, and as well as advocacy groups of the various uh, individuals to identify to us what their needs are so that they can have that capability of being managed. I think you need some help with private sector organizations that uh, have been sensitive to uh, uh, the needs of the population. That's right. People who are in sales and marketing and that kind of thing, they know what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Actually, uh, the, um, we had a representative of CARP uh, sitting on uh, that was invited as an expert. That's your um, problem. <laughs> I I think this, at this point, <laughs> can I say we'll die <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
invite you all to come back uh, next month and we'll hear uh, more specifics about one chip project for uh, a So we'll see you next month. Okay.